We hear God's voice in the Bible and in preaching, in music, and prayer. Listen for God's voice in these readings. The first is found in James. My siblings, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you is lacking in wisdom, ask God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to you. But ask in faith, never doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For the doubter, being double-minded and unstable in every way, must not expect to receive anything of God, from God. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. A reading from Acts. Now in Joppa, there is a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time, it, she became ill and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, who heard that Peter was there, sent two men to him with the request, please come with us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them, and when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the windows stood beside him, weeping and, and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made. While she was there with them, Peter put all of them outside, and then he knelt down and prayed and turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then calling the saints and the widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon, a tanner. Word of God, word of life. Thank you, Quinn, for reading the scripture. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you here today. It's the end of our brief stewardship season here at Our Saviors, the day that we gather the many gifts offered by the people of God, and we commit these gifts to another great year of ministry in God's church. Stewardship describes how we steward or manage the many gifts of great value that God has shared with us. And you'll often hear us use three words to describe the gifts we steward. We talk about time, talents, and treasure. We talk about time and talent in the same breath as our treasure to show that stewardship is about more than giving just money. Certainly, we devote financial gifts to God, but nothing in the church can be accomplished without your valuable time and your priceless talents. We know that for sure. In today's scripture, we find an example of the early church gathering gifts just like these and committing them to do the work of God. And if you want to know just what happens when a church harnesses its gifts, this is the story for you. Because when the people of God gather their time, talents, and treasure in this story, a woman comes back from the dead. The woman at the center of this story, the woman who has died, her name is Tabitha. And in her life, she exemplified everything we normally mean when we talk about stewardship. She was a woman of great talent who used her gifts to sew clothes for the widows in her community. She devoted countless hours to this work, making the precious gift of her time. And we can guess from the text that, she, that while these women were poor, she was not. So she also gave her treasure so they might clothe themselves with dignity. By the time this story has introduced us to this great saint, she has died. And Tabitha's bereaved friends lift up the many garments that testified to the, to the way this woman gave her time, talent, and treasure for the work of God. I'm a little sad for Tabitha in this story, not because she died, rather because her generosity is kind of upstaged by another big gift giver in the story, and that's Peter. Peter, of course, gives the flashiest gift of all because it is the gift of Peter's faith that brings Tabitha back from the dead. But for all its astonishing magnificence, Peter's gift of faith actually flows from pretty recognizable virtues, the kind of stewardship that you or I might reasonably accomplish. 
Because when Peter hears about this situation in Joppa, the death of a beloved saint, there he goes. That's the first gift Peter gives. He drops what he's doing and he makes time for someone else. I don't even think that Tabitha was someone he knew. The gift of new life is only possible because Peter gives more regular gifts first. He gives his compassion and his time. All right, so in Joppa, Tabitha gave time, talents, and treasure. Peter gave tremendous faith. But Peter and Tabitha are not the only ones who give a gift that day. The story also briefly mentions these disciples. It's a bit of a tiny detail, but it's there. Just to recap, when the women grieve in Joppa, these disciples happen to be there, and they know that Peter is in Lydda, the next town over. So they send two men, and these disciples have enough of a connection to Peter that they get his attention. They're the ones that convince him to come. By doing this, by seeking help for these bereaved widows, these disciples also give a gift. Their gift isn't as complete as Tabitha's, and they didn't have Peter's faith. If they did, they could have just raised Tabitha from the dead themselves, right? But they do have a network of love and support. And a good network of people who support you and love you, that can be hard to find. It's actually a different kind of treasure. We call it social capital. And that's the gift these disciples give. They use their social capital to connect these widows with the person who can help. So as the believers share their gifts in these stories, this small church in Joppa becomes a place where great things happen. It becomes a church filled with provocative generosity, where believers motivate each other by the sharing of powerful gifts. The gift of powerful faith, the gift of compassion, the gift of mutual support, it starts when Tabitha gives her time, talents, and treasure. Her many generous gifts in turn provoke the disciples. The disciples' gift of social capital in turn provokes Peter. Peter gives his gift of time and faith so great it even provokes God to contribute a miracle. What provocative generosity. And that's the story we need on this Commitment Sunday. Because on this day... We should find ourselves inspired to feats of generosity in our own community. This whole stewardship season, we've been saying, rise up, people of God, and this is what it means. If you want to see the dead raised in Sioux Falls, this is where it starts. This is the time to rise up. And this is how we inspire one another as we gather the gifts of God. We challenge each other to give generously until we see the dead rise from their graves. So, if you brought one today, this is your time to get out your commitment card. And if you have not brought one today, I want you to think about that. We probably sent one to your house. If you didn't get one at your house, we do have ushers who can hand one out. You can just raise your little hand right now, and we'll bring one to you. We'll give one into your hand. And if you need a pen, we'll give you that too. I want you to hold this in your hand. And if you came here... Without one, I want you to notice that too. I notice that, I, I know that ma many of you really look forward to this day. You truly love this time when we gather God's gifts. And we celebrate not only the good God has done for us, but also the, all the good that God prepares us to accomplish. And I know you are ready to be inspired and to see God's work in this time and place. And this card is the way you join this work. Are you ready? What if you're not? What if you're holding this commitment card and it feels heavy? What if you don't even want one of these things? What if you feel today like you have nothing to give? Nothing to offer? Well, if that's you, you still have a place in this story too. The scripture still has a message for you. You can still hold on to this card. To hear why, though, we just have to return to this story and play it backward. As some of you may remember, they used to say you play certain records backwards and you hear evil messages in the song. Yeah, you've tried. I know who you are. You've tried that with your Led Zeppelin records. <laughs> but today's story works like that, too, just in a divine way. If we track each part of this story backward, we start to hear God whispering a different message about our gifts than we might expect. We start to hear actually a word of welcome, especially for those who feel they have nothing to give. Peter's miracle is the main event in the story, the big gift, so let's start by playing that track backwards. When Peter arrives in Joppa, he meets those widows who show him all the gifts that Tabitha had given. If we start from this miracle, where you're raising Tabitha from the dead, and we go backwards, we see 
that the widows are the people we hear. We notice that Peter does not raise Tabitha from the dead because he loved her, or even because his faith was truly tro- so tremendous. Peter raised Tabitha from the dead as a response to the grief of those widows. Well, so what about Tabitha's story? She was a person of great gifts, renowned for her charity work, known for putting every skill she had to the service of God. But if we ask why she did those things, if we play her story backward, there we hear it again. Tabitha didn't give these gifts for her own sake or because God, you know, she gave her gifts because she heard the story of, and the cry of these widows. Even if we look at those disciples who drew on their network of love and support to call Peter, even if we look at them and we ask, why did they do what they did? Again, we notice they did this because they heard the cry of the widows. The story sounds like it's about all these great gifts that people give, but if we play the whole thing backward, we keep hearing these voices of these unnoticeable, unnameable widows, which means this story is about much more than the gifts of great value gathered by the saints. It's about much more than gifts, because these women had nothing to give. They had no money, no treasure. They had no particular talent for faith. These women had only one thing, grief. It's all we know of them. They were widows, people defined by their loss. And grief, my friends, is not a gift. It is not a gift to suffer the death of someone you love. It is not a gift to carry that kind of suffering or find your whole life reshaped by bereavement. This story, with its strain of provocative generosity, it all begins because these widows offer up their grief. The grief of these widows drives the whole story, and this is true even though grief is not a gift but an impoverishment. Because of this, I feel this story is pushing me to make a distinction. To understand the full picture of generosity and grace in this story of Christian community, we need to distinguish between a gift and an offering. Today, I want to define a gift as anything of intrinsic value gathered and shared by the people of God. That's time, talents, and treasure. Things of value gathered and shared by the people of God. Tabitha, Peter, and the disciples, they all give gifts. But an offering is more than just a thing of great value. An offering is anything, anything at all, given to God so that God's goodness might be known on this earth. The valuable things we give are time, talents, and treasures or types of offering, but they're not the only kind. God can use anything to show God's purpose. And that's what these women show us when they offer their grief. When we give something like bitterness or grief or weakness to God, We give these things not because we cherish them, but because we hope God will transform them. Even that which we typically consider worthless, unprofitable, futile, virtueless, or vain is something God can use, because God can use it all. And would you expect anything less from the God who brings life from the grave? The problem is we often only talk about generous gifts as the kind of offerings that matter. We do feel truly inspired by those who generously give of their resources, but then because we are sinful, we start to compare. People with greater gifts seem like better people. We start to believe there's something wrong with us when we have fewer gifts to give. It's almost baked right into the chart on the commitment card. In our story from today, there are people with great gifts, but they don't drive the action. On the other hand, the widows are the only ones without a gift to give. But they freely offer their grief to God, not as a gift, but that God might use their grief to show forth God's glory. And without their honest offering, Tabitha would have remained in the grave. All the gifts in their community, the network of support from the disciples, Tabitha's skill in sowing, even Peter's great faith, all of these gifts would have languished purposeless without the women who offered their grief and who allowed God to transform it. So today, the story of Tabitha's widows shows us that every person, even those whose gifts are few, has something to offer to God. We just have to trust that God can take what we offer and transform it for the sake of God's glory. In this story, widows offer their grief, but If an offering can be anything, it's more than even just a negative emotion or our impoverishment. You can offer an idea 
or a stray thought, or a question you've always wanted to ask, or a doubt, or a need that you think nobody has fulfilled, or a bother, something that's stuck in your craw. Your offering can be anything, and we steward those gifts too. You folks know I just took a pie in the face at bingo night a couple weeks ago. Thanks for that, by the way. And you know we raised over $6,000 for ELC World Hunger through that event, and this whole thing started with an idea from a confirmation student in January. He said, what if we did a bingo night to raise money for ELCA World Hunger? And soon another kid said, could we stick a pie in one of your faces? And another kid said, we could call numbers at the bingo night. And another group said, well, we can make food for a bake sale. On and on it went. And look what God has done with this one idea, this one insufficient offering. God has taken this crumb of an idea and transformed it into a gift that'll feed the world. So now, I want you to look at your commitment card again. And maybe you came here today ready to be generous, ready to feel inspired by the provocative generosity of others in our community and in our sacred stories. Or maybe this card asks you to express yourself in a way you simply cannot. Make a gift today of any amount because we do multiply every dollar you give to our ministry. Such gifts have even led to the resurrection of the dead. And truth be told, we just cannot do ministry in this place without your gifts. We just can't. So give a gift if you are able. But to hear the full story of God's goodness in this place, what we really need from every single one of you is your offering. That's what we need. We need your idea. We need your loving heart. We need your confirmation sermon notes. We need your art. We need your questions. We need your doubt. We need your grief and your pain. Compared to a big dollar gift, such offerings may feel insignificant. But without offerings like these, all the gifts we gather have nowhere to go and nothing to do.